Rev it up and welcome to Cars Yeah, show number 1,400. Can you believe it? That's a lot of inspiration. Refusing to admit that I can't do something. This is Cars Yeah, where you'll enjoy interviews with inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Mark Green is here to provide you with a fuel injection of automotive inspiration. So get in, sit down, buckle up, and get ready for a wild ride here on Cars Yeah. Do you know the best way to protect your vehicle, both the exterior and the interior, is with a car cover? I've been using Covercraft car covers since 1975. That's right, 1975. It's a fast, easy, and inexpensive way to keep your vehicle looking new. Covercraft has been manufacturing premium quality exterior and interior covers for over 50 years with a stellar reputation for durability and design. They're the world's largest manufacturer of custom patterned vehicle covers that are crafted to fit over 80,000 patterns and growing. They are the only cover I'll put on my vehicles. You can choose from a wide variety of fabrics, styles, colors, and more. From full cover designs for factory to custom made vehicles, plus convertible top covers, trucks, truck cab coolers, motorcycles, scooters, ATVs, trailers, campers, personal watercraft, and a wide variety of custom features. Covercraft is the right choice. Learn more today at Covercraft.com and tell them Mark sent you. That's Covercraft.com. Mark Green here. I'm a car care fanatic. You know that. And I've discovered Migliori Luxury Car Care Products. Migliori Strata Coating is a ceramic treatment that you can easily apply by yourself. It provides your special vehicle with a high gloss finish and lasts for over a year. Migliori Strata Coating features an extreme hydrophobic finish, so water sheets right away, reducing water spotting, and it makes your car washing a breeze. With over 100 positive reviews on Amazon, this is a time-tested product that's made here in the USA. With fall and winter on the way, protect your vehicle's finish with Migliori. You'll find all their premium car care products at Migliori. MigliorIWax.com. Plus, you'll get 10% off at checkout by using the code CARS. Yeah, 10% off. What a deal. That's M I G L I O R E Wax.com. Hello, automotive enthusiasts. I'm revved up and so excited to introduce today's very special guest calling in from Ontario, Canada, David Granger. David, are you buckled up and ready for a fun ride? Well, I pretty much am, yeah. <laughs> well, good. I'll try to keep it between the guardrails. David Granger is the founder of the Guild of Automotive Restores, a company he and his wife, Janice, established back in 1991. His shop is a world-renowned facility that repairs, restores, and sells classic and antique cars. They do mechanical work, body work, paint, upholstery, fabrications, transportation, storage, just about everything. David is the host of a successful worldwide broadcasted television series, Restoration Garage, now in its sixth season. Congratulations for that. Located in the town of Bradford, about 45 minutes north of Toronto, Canada, the Guild of Automotive Restores is open to the public with a fantastic showroom, a fun store, workshops, and talented craftsmen who work on and restore some of the finest automobiles in the world. So, David, before I jump into a couple of questions I have for you today, I've told our listeners just a tiny bit about you. Take a moment and share a little bit more about this incredible career you have and a very obvious passion for restoring and caring for fine old automobiles. I, I really haven't figured out what I want to do yet for a career, but this is just sort of a... Oh, oh come on. It, it, it's, it's, <laughs> uh, it's getting me through that decision-making process, you know. Well, good. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, no kidding. <laughs> this, this is what happens when um, you, you uh, turn a hobby into a profession. None of this has been planned. It has just been uh, me blundering about in the dark, and uh, and look what happened behind me. So, <laughs> well, you know what? Part of me laughs at that, but part of me just goes, uh, "Come on now, uh, you've got to have planned some of this out." But you know, you and I, I we've been able to talk a bunch of times, and uh, we just ran into each other down at uh, Pebble Beach Car Week, and uh, I got to see one of your most recent builds, that incredible car you created which we'll talk about a little bit. But I want to first ask you if you have a success quote or a mantra, some kind of saying, maybe it's in the shop or maybe it's in your mind of how you run your life. It's a nice way to get the inspirational tires turning here on Cars, yeah? So I know you love to drive, David. Grab the wheel. Well, you know, um, 
I think one of the most powerful driving forces in my life has been basically refusing to admit that I can't do something. And um, and even at that, I you know, and people around me will all uh, all know this. And I I rarely start start at the bottom. I like to start at the top. Well, no kidding. With the cars that you guys restore, I want to you know this quote, this concept is perfect for a little bit of a segue into the car that you shared down at Pebble, that beautiful green car that you built out of titanium. I believe no, no, it, it was is. Uh, magnesium. Magnesium, magnesium. It, was titanium. <laughs> yeah, it might have been easier. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, yeah. Tell our listeners a little bit about this car because I, I was listening to you explain it on Jay Leno's Garage. And then when I saw you and I got to see the car in person, I, I'm just blown away. Yeah. Talk about starting at the top and t- something that you've never done before that seems almost impossible. Tell our listeners about this ride. Well, you know, if you start at the top of something, you're not aware of the things you can't do. And uh, this was certainly one of these. I mean, I, I can remember um, when I was approached, the first time I was ever approached to do some work on a Bugatti, it was a T59 uh, Grand Prix car, a 3.3 liter, uh, 3.3 liter Grand Prix car. And I said, well, geez, Bugatti, it's just a car. How hard can it be? And of course, uh, and, and you can't start much more at the top of Bugattis than, than the, the Grand Prix cars. And there was a lot of lessons learned there. But fortunately, I'm a fast study and I had a great staff at the time and I still maintain a great staff. We hit the ground running with that one and got through it. And as a matter of fact, we actually put in times as far as completion times on that car better than some of the shops in Europe who've been doing them for 20 years or more. You know, that's just part of that whole, uh, you know, refusing to concede to defeat. Say no. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, well, tell yeah, some challenges about this thing. Yeah. The, the early came about was it when I was building the Grand Prix cars, was sort of all of the chassis and drive line, complete engine transmission, rear end, even all the brake components and the and the cables, uh, everything was sort of included in some Grand Prix parts that, parts that I bought. And it was more like a bribe to get me to buy the Grand Prix parts than it was uh, anything else. And, and uh, you know, we got all these bits and pieces in and and it just sat around for a number of years, uh, because what do you do with a chassis? And I thought, well, there is a chassis class at Pebble, but once you've done that, what do you do with it? So I started kicking around ideas for putting a body on it. And the cars I liked, just three or four of them I really liked still exist. So I went, well, I didn't want to do that. You know, like that, what's the point? Uh, but the car that I, that I kept thumbing the pages back to in the, in the Bugatti Magnum was the Aerolith, which was mysterious. It only existed for 10 months, then it disappeared off the face of the earth. It was only at the Paris show and then at that show in England. And one little drive that was reported by a, a British gentleman. And that was it. Um, so that piqued my interest. And there's this huge automotive mystery. People have been searching for it for a long time. And it, it, the chances of it appearing, well, I would love it to appear now. Uh, I'd like to be the one who found it. But <laughs> Yeah, yeah, um, wouldn't we know, all? This seemed to be the, the, the perfect solution. So I set about, uh, made plans to build it. I did about three years of research. In that research, I discovered there was only two blueprints available of the original car. One was for the radiator, which was actually very helpful. And the other one was for the brake pedal. And not the whole brake pedal, just the brake <laughs> pedal. Pad. It? Yeah. Oh, my so gosh. That, that wasn't quite as helpful. So then we had 11 photographs of the car that were viable. And uh, most of them were sort of the same angles, but just different elevations. So actually, that later came in handy. And that's what we did. We scaled the entire car off of the only perfect known measure we had. And, you know, you can look at wheels and know what size the wheels and tires are, but there can be millimeters of difference in those measurements. So that those were inconsistent. The only thing we had in all those photographs to scale it by was the rad cap. And I had a T57 rad cap, so I knew exactly the measure. So the car was so many rad caps long and so many rad caps high and so many rad caps yeah. wide. <laughs> you <Wow>. know. And and <laughs> yeah. that was how we got the perfect scaling. And then, you know, we took original photographs, we blew them up to life size so that we could get the detail like the rivet march on the fins and all that kind of thing were all done by laying an absolute perfect life size blow up of the photograph down on the pieces of magnesium and then indexing the center of every single one of those rivets you can see on the magnesium before we would drill a hole in everything to receive them. So it was pretty exacting work. It took seven years. It took a year to learn how to handle magnesium because uh, it is not easy. 
it has a mind of its own. It just wants to be flat. And so to persuade it that it doesn't want to be flat is quite a task, you know, and it's brittle and it's prone to movement afterwards. And it was a very, very demanding project, but we managed to pull it off. And, um, you know, there was a lot of detractors when we first started. I mean, I, I ran a two-year-long argument with uh, the curator of the Bugatti Trust in Britain over details on the car. He was convinced he was right, and I didn't care because I said, I'm replicating the error-led coachwork on 57104. But uh, as we were building this, I found out more and more to the point where we actually knew more about the original car than anybody else because we had basically found through the building of it, keeping such intimate detail, that we were actually building the original car. We knew what kind of chassis it sat on. We knew exactly how wide it was. And and then when we looked at shadows underneath the car, we could match up our shadows underneath our car with a standard, with the photographs of the car at the Parrot Show. But supercharged cars and cars with different chassis, the shadows underneath were completely different. So we sort of locked in all that My information. Gosh. So. Yeah. Wow. Uh, and so, the, you know, once <laughs> once the car rolled out, uh, all of the uh, naysayers sort of just shut up. Backed off. Yeah. They backed well, off, it's, yeah. Yeah. It's stunning. It's absolutely stunning. Yeah. It won, yeah. it won International Historical Car of the Year in England in 2013. So, I mean, th- that was, uh, you know, that was a big boy prize. And yeah. it was something I never expected to take. We were up against cars like Malcolm Campbell's Bluebird and everything. So I just thought, wasn't it nice that they invited us? You could have knocked us all over when they announced the winner, I'll tell you. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, congratulations to you and your team. I mean, this is obviously a big part of a labor of love in many ways. There's a certain bit of hatred mixed in with that. Is there? Well, I'm sure there was <laughs> along the way, but we don't need to go into that kind of stuff. I want to go back in time, though, and talk about a story that instigated your personal passion for cars. I, you you must have been a car guy all your life. Is there a pivotal moment when you knew you were indeed going to be a car guy for life? You know, you know what? It was sort of a gradual transition, but, it, you know, it was more Janus. Uh, the, the restoration part of it was more Janus inspired. What I was was a car abuser. By the time I was 24, I had 24 cars. They didn't used to last me very long. I was a street racer. And, uh, you know, and I used to figure out ways to beat guys. And I mean, I had a, a 70 Grand Prix with a real fancy uh, carburation system that was standard to it and just tweaked a little bit and poured lead into the trunk to give me some weight on the back wheels. And I, I put Pirelli tires on it, which nobody had ever heard of in those days. So while the Camaros and that were making all kinds of smoke and stuff, um, I was like three, you know, you three were getting car traction. I got, yeah. I hooked up and I was three car lengths ahead before they came out of their smoke show. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, let's talk a little bit about this incredible life you built uh, around you and Janice and, and all your teammates there around cars. I'd love for you to talk about a big challenge or a failure. Now, you seem to take on projects that are fraught with potential challenge. So there's probably a lot to choose from here. But the reason I like to ask the question is the learning lesson. That's the most important part of falling on your face, right? Don't step there. You might fall on your face. So walk us through maybe one, perhaps, and tell us how that specific experience helped you gain even more momentum in your career, in your life, in your business. You know, I really can't think of just one because just about every restoration that you do, uh, you come up with the unexpected. Uh, And it can be either, uh, you know, people who've worked on the car before or just idiosyncrasies about the car or the life it's had or, uh, you know, even uh, inexperienced staff members, you know, who uh, forge ahead with something without uh, uh, coming and asking the right questions. So there's a lot of that. I've always managed to pull stuff off. Uh, You know, uh, there have been projects that have stopped uh, halfway through, but it's generally because the owners run out of the impetus. They start to, uh, uh, they they may start to listen to us, (laughs) you know, Um, (laughs) when we say, no, we don't think this is a good idea. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I heard you talk in a show once about, you know, if you're planning to do a restoration, just, just expect to fiddle away money. Her federal oh, yeah. money. This, I you mean, know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's literally, I mean, if you think a boat is a great way to throw, uh, you know, throw money down into a hole in the water, uh, restoring a car is a nonsensical thing. In some cases, it's completely idiotic. A sensible chap or woman will come by and they'll say, how much? Well, look, how much is the car worth? They say, well, the car is going to be worth $24,000 when you're done, and it'll be about a quarter million dollars to get it there. Yeah, and exactly. a sensible person, there's just no, I mean, there's not even a second thought about that. It's just dumb. 
But, you know, the yeah. thing is, that's not what drives people forward in restoring cars. I mean, restoration, uh, you know, when I first started restoring cars, it was thirty, forty thousand bucks. got a beautiful restoration on a car. And now to do a really comprehensive restoration, uh, you know, that's beautifully done is one hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. If it's concourse, it soars above that. It sounds like huge money, but it's just the world as it is now. You know, because when you look at the hours, we're actually more efficient now than we were 25, 30 years ago. So our yeah, hours are down. Of knowledge. But, but the costs are just astronomical. You know, when I first started, you could buy a, you know, a carburetor for a, a TR3 or something. You could buy it for 25 bucks at the flea market or, you know, like you, mm-hmm. you could buy, you know, three for 10 bucks. Now, <laughs> if somebody knows you need one, you're going to pay uh, four or 500 bucks for that carburetor. I mean, prices are just gotten absolutely ridiculous because people know you need it. And of course, as the years have progressed, the volume and and source of these parts has disappeared. A lot of the chaps who had the bits passed away and, uh, and, and, and all the bits they had just got thrown out. Uh, and that's happened multiple times with fairly large businesses that nobody wanted to keep running. So if, you're, if you have a customer that walks in and wants to restore a car, and I mean, most of these are labors of love, really. And the, the concept of investment it really needs to be thrown right out the window, right? It, you know, there are investment cars, but I mean, they're the kind of cars that as a wreck, you pay three or four hundred thousand dollars for, and then you put another half million bucks into them. But when you're done, you may have something that's worth two or three or four million dollars. That's okay. But let's face it, that's rarefied air. And, you know, the average guy who wants a, his, you know, 53 Chevy restored is not even thinking in those directions. Right. Exactly. I know I have a listener that listens every day and he, he sends me emails quite often. He knows who he is. Uh, his name starts with a C. He's going through this right now with a Pantera and it's just a never ending hole. What would be your advice for Chris? <laughs> Stop. Oh, uh, for, on, a, on a Pantera? <laughs> Uh, go yeah. and find a really, really nice one and buy it. Yeah, and save there you yourself, go. I told- save yourself uh, 75% of the cost of, it, of restoring it because, you know, Pinteras are still, whilst they have been starting to soar, they're not a $50,000 car anymore, but they certainly are, are, you know, they're still not a quarter million dollar car. But, you know, they're really fussy to restore. I have done Panteras in the past. Um, they also were prone to rust. I mean, you get some really rusty Panteras if they were yeah, stored just in a, in a garage or something. Yeah. The restorer may think it's going to be easy, but they're not. They're prone to all those problems that early, you know, car, early seventies cars had: bad metals, bad metallurgy, bad welds. You know, and they have a big, heavy American block sitting in the middle of this fairly fragile European coach work. So, you know, you've got to look for stress uh, and structural damage with them as well. Well, there you go, Chris. From the words of the master. Uh, go find yourself the best one you can. Some other guy spent a lot of money. Yeah, stored. always look for somebody else who blew their brains out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then buy their car for thirty grand. There you go. That's that's the words of wisdom. There, there's the financial advisor. Well, how about your first really special vehicle? Uh, you talked about cars that you beat the bloody hell out of, but let's let's go to a, the first car that had great meaning for you. Now, this could be the first really special restoration or the first car that you bought that you owned and maybe share a memory you have about that ride. I have, I've been extraordinarily spoiled my life. I've had a lot of amazing cars. In my very first car, it was a 59 Ford, uh, four door in Brown. And I loved it <laughs> okay. to death. It had no exhaust system yeah. on it and it not, no manifold. It, the, it vented straight out the side of a block. So we used to call it Thunder Bucket, and so did the policeman when he finally pulled me over. <laughs> Thunder Bucket. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was pretty loud. You know, uh, you don't drive through a yeah. city in the middle of the night with that car. That's what got me pulled over. But uh, I'm fond of those. I'm not fond enough to ever buy one. Uh, and honestly, there are a few cars that have stuck with me. I drove military vehicles and Land Rovers and that for years, and I, I really like them. But the car that that I still had the greatest regret on having owned and sold was a uh, 1929 Le Mans Bentley with original Van der Plaat coachwork on it, the Le Mans coachwork. Uh, it was a locomotive of a car. It was, I drove it at, on, uh, you know, in, in uh, 30 mile an hour zones, I drive it at 60 miles an hour, hoping to get a ticket. So I could just put the ticket on the wall, you know, that I was, <laughs> you know, look at this. I did this. Rabble one. rouser. Yeah. It was the <laughs> yeah. only, it's the only 1920s car of any sort that I would cheerfully hop into and drive from New York to Los Angeles, fully trusting it to do it. 
a magnificent car. And, and the moment it was gone, I knew that I was going to miss it. And, and I have actually run into that car a couple of times. It doesn't have a key. I know I, I know how to start it without a key, so I could actually steal it. And I may one day. You, you never know. Take, well, we won't, we won't go there. I would advise <laughs> against that. But uh, you, you jumped ahead to a great question, and that's the seller. Color. They seller's never figure remorse. it out. They never figure it out. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Well, I would love for you to share what has you excited and fired up these days at the Guild of Automotive Restorers. I know in our pre-show chat, you talked about you're about to head off uh, to France to do some filming of uh, your television show. I'd love to hear a little bit about that and also maybe upcoming projects going on in the shop that you're really happy about. Well, you know, um, the France trip is sort of reacquainting myself with old friends. Uh, I'm meeting up with Andrew Crisford, who I met many years ago when I was doing Bugattis. Uh, he is a collector of Bugattis and, and numerous other interesting cars, which he has in England. He's also got a, a place in the south of France and where he keeps cars he likes to drive on the roads. He says that the Bugattis and that, it's too dangerous in England to drive them much on the roads. So the French roads are more open and you know don't have the congestion. So I'm, I'm you know, and he told me about a wonderful event at a little town called Angelim, which is near where he lives, and it's called the Rally of the Ramparts, and basically it's a race that is held inside the ramparts of a medieval uh, hilltop town. And uh, it's very challenging and everything, and they also have a rally. So I've always wanted to go. And uh, in 2000, he invited me, and I couldn't get there because it was one of my first years going to Pebble. So I, I couldn't make it, and I've been sort of storing it up for years. And this year, I went, well, you know what? Uh, we have business over in France. Let's go do Angelim. So uh, we're going to go to Angelim. Uh, there's a couple of collectors there who are magnanimously, without knowing my driving skills, are offering me cars to run in the uh, in, in the rally. I don't know that that's a good idea. Go. What what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> well, now that they've heard uh, your your uh, unlawful youthful past, I think I may have blown that. But uh, sorry well, about the, that. <laughs> and I was also on track with uh, both, you know, uh, it, it right up into open wheel, uh, you know, cars on track. So I know many different cool. ways to abuse a car, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Good for you. Put yeah. that, put but, that uh, plaque yeah, on so, the wall. <laughs> yeah. After Angelim, uh, then we are picking up stakes and driving across France to Malouze. It's uh, like an eight-hour drive, and that should be spectacular because it's not a highway drive. And uh, when we're in Malouze, the director of the uh, museum that holds the Schlumpfla Brothers collection, the largest collection, I've got over 300 Bugattis there, along with other uh, treasures, and it's the, the French government owns it, it's the National Collection of France. They're picking me up from the hotel in a car from their collection, and they're taking Janice and I on a special tour, and then uh, interesting things in the area, and then also uh, through the museum itself. So. That should be great. Uh, you know, it'll be nice. There, they have Bugattis there that I've always wanted to see, and I have never had the opportunity to actually uh, see firsthand. So, uh, and it's a learning experience. I'll have a camera, and I'll be taking lots of photographs of. I'm always interested in the actual techniques that were employed by various people, various engineers when they were building a lot of these cars. And you know, like uh, year to year, they would change. And I sort of had this little mental library of tricks that they used in the 1920s and 30s that I like to be able to call on when I'm doing stuff now. Oh, yeah. You know, when I was at Pebble on the Lawn, I talked to a gentleman that had a beautiful race car that had this hand-hammered dash. And I talked at length to him about how he figured out how to do that. I have another friend, David Smith. You may know of him. He's know, a judge David, yeah. at Pebble and, re yeah, restores cars. And I remember him talking about a car he restored years ago that had special hammer marks on the engine block. And he worked and worked to try to figure out how did they do that? Yeah, those old restoration techniques are fantastic. It's been way too long since I've been to the Schumpf Museum. Love to go back. I think the last time I was there was, gosh, 15 years ago or something. It is an incredible place. So, uh, But they didn't pick me up at the airport or anything in a special car. <laughs> you, you got a little more clout than I do, but uh, I think you guys are going to have a fantastic, you and Janice, oh, what a trip. I'm I'm jealous. Well, David, up next is the last lap. Before we put the pedal to the metal, let's say thank you to today's Cars Yes yeah, sponsors. When you want proven performance, there's one brand that's been around since 1938. That's Edelbrock, building the finest American-made performance products for the street 
and track. Edelbrock's products are designed and dyno proven to deliver maximum results. Edelbrock has thousands of made in the USA performance products for all makes and models. From their new AVS2 carburetor and innovative ProFlow 4 EFI for your muscle car or truck. To superchargers for your daily driver and more, visit edelbrock.com. To check out the latest products for your ride and when you're ready to check out, enter cars yeah in the coupon code and get 10% off your order. That that's Edelbrock, automotive performance since 1938. You take care of your cars, but who takes care of your investments? Tune-ups aren't just for engines. Updating your financial plan is important too. Your GPS may take you from A to B, but it won't help you on the road to financial freedom. For that, you need a good co-pilot and a very trusted advisor. Chris Kimball, CFP, is just the man for the job. He'll guide you down that road without driving you crazy. For over 25 years, Chris has helped people just like you and me with their financial planning and investments. With a master's degree in financial services, he is eminently qualified, and he's a car guy too. Learn more at chrisvkimball.com or call 866-ON-A-PLAN. Securities through Money Concepts Capital Corp. Member FINRA SIPC. CK Financial Services is not affiliated with Money Concepts Capital Corp. Are you looking for a way to get your products or services into the ears of thousands of automotive enthusiasts around the globe? I can help. This is Mark Green here at Cars Yeah, and I'd be honored to be an influencer and ambassador for your brand in a unique and personal way. Five days a week, thousands of subscribers and listeners enjoy the Cars Yeah podcast and website. Contact me today and I'll show you how at mark at carsyeah.com or connect with me through the Cars yeah website at carsyeah.com. All right, David, I'm going to get into your skull a little bit here, into your head and ask you a very introspective question. If you woke up tomorrow and David Granger was a car parked in the garage, not what you want to be, but how you perceive yourself manifested as a vehicle, what would you be and why? Well, that's an interesting question. Um, <laughs> Probably something no one's ever asked you before. <laughs> yeah, no. Uh, you know, I remember that series, My Mother, the Car. It wasn't great. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to do better today. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's like you know Mr. What? Ed, the I, horse. I'm going to go with the first. <laughs> Honestly, as you asked that question, the first thing that sprang into my mind, I guess I'd have to go with that. Because if I'm overthinking, I can think, oh, I, you know, there's that. Oh, yeah. Uh, it, it was an M38 Jeep, the little 1953 early Korean War Jeep with the flat fenders that was based on the uh, sick World War MB. Ah. Um, yeah. it's, they've always been special. They were rugged. I love the the sound they make. Um, they will always get you where you're going. Um, you know, they're just, they're sort of an all around, well, you know, I really, when I think about it, they'll always get you there and you, nobody can ever convince an M38. It can't do what you're making, asking it to do. And that's how I've lived well, pretty much my go. life. So there you go. Yeah. I love it. Perfect answer. <laughs> nice. How about the best automotive advice you've ever received? Oh, I've already given that during the show. It's go and <laughs> find the best one that somebody else has killed themselves restoring and buy it. There you go. So you can that just call David and say, give me, give me a list of your customers that you've restored cars for. I'm going to start calling them and buy a car from them. That's the way to do it. <laughs> Would you share one of your personal habits you believe has contributed to your many successes over the years? Laziness. Oh, come on. No, seriously. <laughs> you, <can't>. um, you <laughs> know what? If you're lazy... Uh, you have to figure out really efficient ways of doing things, uh, and uh, I so you. Okay. so if you're lazy, okay. you have a you have a you got to step up on people who aren't lazy because they'll approach something like a buzzsaw, and uh, they'll expend five times more effort getting to the other end of it than you will because you're lazy. So you think about it first. What's the easiest way to do something, and that's the way you do it. So I'd say laziness work smarter, not harder. There you that's go. That's right. How about, a, how about a resource? There are so many these days. Is there one in particular that's kind of a go-to for you? Maybe it's a website, a blog, a supplier, or a person in your life. I'm a little bit old-fashioned, but honest to God, um, it's still Hemmings. Uh, Hemmings Motors. I mean, I do Google stuff and that, but uh, you know, I get it once a month. I still use it for uh, you know looking at pricing, realistic pricing, not you know like uh, auction pricing. 
it is the Bible, and it leads you to the information. Even if you know, even if it's not there, it can lead you to somebody who can give it to you. You know, suppliers who may know the answer and all that kind of thing. So, it's probably one of the most valuable tools that anybody in this business can use. And and you know, if you want to lean on the internet, that's fine. But boy, you have to have really good knowledge to know what on the internet is just bull, because there's an awful lot of the information that you pull up that isn't right. So you have to be an expert before you go to the experts. Whereas with Hemmings, you know, a neophyte can get into Hemmings. He can go through, he can find suppliers and that kind of thing. He can phone and he can ask them the questions. And most people uh, are still pretty old school uh, that are that are advertising there. And they're willing to spend some time talking to you and help you with problems. So uh, that's, yeah, that's uh, yeah. the Bible. That's why yeah, they've always called it the Bible. That's <laughs> for right. Sure. If I could wave a magic wand and arrange for you to sit down and have a drink or a meal with anyone in the automotive industry, living or deceased, who would it be? Uh, it would have to be Gene Bugatti, you know, at wow. son. Uh, you know, he was brilliant. His, uh, unlike Henry Ford, who basically never acknowledged Edsel Ford as uh, as an engineer or with any ideas, always wanted to toe the line. At Torrey Bugatti was very different with Gene Bugatti. He acknowledged that he was probably a better engineer. Um, and he 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 let him have his head, and and Gene Bugatti is the guy who inarguably created the most successful Bugattis of all time, and that was the um, the, the Type Fifty Seven, and he was more focused on cars as as user friendly for buyers of of cars for the road, whereas his father had always been far more heavily involved in race cars. And basically, Atore created race cars, and then when they were finished racing or or when they were racing, he put car coach work on them. So they were always sort of diminutive and a little bit awkward and and that. But, you know, underneath, they were a race car. Whereas Gene Bugatti took the Type 57s and he created these wonderful creatures. And, you know, the Aerolift is a great example. It failed. As a design exercise, it was panned in 1935. You know, like the the media went, "What? Oh my God! What a weird looking thing!" They didn't understand it. But you know, three years later, everybody is doing teardrops and using that sort of uh, beautiful coachwork and everything. And so he was perhaps a little bit ahead of the time. Had he lived, and he died uh, testing one of the tank cars, and actually the testing was over. He was just going for a drive, and a mailman pedaled across the road in front of him, and he went off the road, hit a tree, and killed himself. And I think that was 1938 or 39. Can't remember right now. But my honest opinion is that had Gene Bugatti lived, the Bugatti company wouldn't have foundered in the late 40s and into the 50s. And if uh, Enzo Ferrari would never have been able to launch Ferrari because that environmental niche would have been filled by Bugatti still. Wow. Now there's a thought. Holy cow. <laughs> there's a major thought. Well, you can channel him when you're there at the museum next week and uh, bring him into your skull a little bit. So uh, there you go. How about a book? Are you a book reader? Is there a book you'd like to share with our listeners that you've enjoyed? Um, well, I, I, I guess I read, well, I used to read five or six books a week. I've slowed down now because my eyes aren't that good. Mm, yeah, I um, hear you. I don't really read books on cars or anything like that. Um, That's you know? okay. It could be a business book or... Oh, nothing that dry. I mean, um, <laughs> geez, what was the last book? The trouble is I can't remember the bloody names, but um, a lot of it's been science fiction and horror and just fantasy and all that kind of thing. Yeah, just something fun to kind of free your mind a little bit. But I think the things that I read the most of on a weekly basis are, are books and papers on paleontology. Really? Yep. Interesting. Yep, that and, and, and the well, marine life. Oh, cool. Very well-rounded man you are, Dave. <laughs> I like that. Very cool. Well, we are up to the checkered flag, and this last question can be a bit of a doozy, especially for a guy like you. I'm going to buy you any cool collector car today. doesn't matter who owns it or where it is, and you probably know where all the great ones are, but I'm going to buy it for you today and park it in your garage. But there's some rules to this game that may make it a little bit of a challenge for you. One is you can't sell it to buy a bunch of other toys with, so that little trick is off the table. You have to drive it. No garage queens allowed, but I don't think that's a problem for you. But here's the kicker. It's the only one collector car you can have. You have to get rid of everything else. You can only have one. What's it going to be? Uh, it's going to be a pre-war Alfa Romeo, the eight Cs with the closed-in back uh, fenders, the great big long hoods, that amazing Art Deco sculptural form. Uh, certainly going to be one of these. And if you can't find me one of those, well, I'll have to take one of the blower Bentleys from 1929. 
Oh, okay. You gave me you gave me a little break there. I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, the Bentley's going to be a little cheaper than that eight C. That's for sure. But uh, I'd much rather park an eight C in your garage. I think that fits you much better with the toys you've gotten to play with. Well, that sounds like fun, David. I really appreciate you taking some time out of your incredibly busy life to talk to me today. This has been fantastic. Really enjoyed your stories. I want to thank you for sharing your journey. Could you offer us maybe a little piece of wisdom or guidance before you drive off into the sunset in that Alpha 8C? <laughs> Always enjoy the cars for what and when they were, not how they are now. So don't jump out of your Lexus and jump into a 1930s or 40s or 50s, anything, and expect it to be the same. You have to transport yourself back to where it was because it can't come to you. You know, it's great advice. And the way I used to do that with old cars is I always kept a pair of string back gloves and I would put them on. And as I put them on, I would close my eyes and think about what was it like then. Uh, yeah. I think that's great advice. Yeah, most definitely. But leave lots of distance between yeah. you and the car in front of you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Brakes, baby. <laughs> Brakes. Because you're not going to be able to stop like you can in that Lexus or anything else you're driving these days. What's the best way for our listeners to learn more about you and follow along with all the wonderful things you're doing these days? Um, well, probably the TV show is is one of the most intimate things because they really do just follow things we're actually doing. If you see it there, it is actually happening here or has happened here. It's actually documentary. It's not reality TV. So it has a different sort of uh, setback from, from a lot of the, the car shows on. And uh, or there's, uh, you know, the Guild's website, guildclassiccars.com, and, or just the Internet in general. I find there's lots of people who have lots to say about me, some of it quite insulting, which I think is amusing, <laughs> <laughs> anywhere on the Internet. And by the way, just so everybody knows, it's not a toupee. <laughs> no, I'm very jealous of David's hair, that's for sure, because I've got none. Uh, he's got a great head of hair, so uh, yes, yeah, but I still, there you somebody go. Somebody accused me of wearing a dead cat the other day. So A dead cat. Well, you can talk to your hairdresser about that, <laughs> see if they can help you with I can't help you with that, but uh, hey, David, this has been really fun. I knew it would be. Thanks for being so generous today with your time and expertise and for sharing your life's journey, which is incredible. Uh, have fun in France. Until you and I talk again, I'll see you down the road. Cheers. Thank you very much. Hey, Mark Green here from Cars Yeah. Did you know you can now see me on the Cars Yeah TV show? It's a weekly visit to some of my past Cars Yeah podcast guests, and I take you along for the ride. You go behind the garage door and into their lives, their businesses, and you get to see what makes them successful. With tens of millions of viewers, Cars Yeah TV is making its mark. Cars Yeah TV is available on MAV TV and Lucas Oil Racing TV. You'll find MAV TV on Direct TV. Fubo TV, Fios by Verizon, or you can stream it through Lucas Oil Racing Television online. And they said I only had a face for podcasting. Thank you so much for joining us on today's ride here at Cars Yeah. Drive on over to CarsYeah.com to find show notes and inspiring automotive fun. Download your free copy of Filler Up, a fun book filled with gorgeous photographs of fuel filler fun, including quotes from more inspiring automotive enthusiasts. Download your copy today, and we'll see you next time on Cars Yeah!